Thabiti, thank you for your message. I mean, raise your hand if you've heard a message exhorting pastors to disciple older women. Wow. Well done, brother. Oh, we got one. We got one. Tell, well, them, tell them where you go to church. Yeah, wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she goes to Thavidi's church. So. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Yeah, I, I also appreciate it, bro- brother. I, and I, I love the stories I've heard about you soliciting feedback from the, the ladies in your congregation. I love the call to generational and gendered conscientiousness and just thinking in the context of identity politics in our culture right now and the some good, some bad in that big ball. Here we have the Apostle Paul 2,000 years before addressing this in a healthy, life-giving, deliberate sort of way. There it is in the Word of God. It's got what we need. And then the way you connected it to how this is going to transform the culture of of individuals and the people of God as a whole. And the church can be held up as this counterculture, this this model of generational and gendered carefulness and conscientiousness in a way our culture just doesn't have the resources to get, you know, go there. So thank you for helping lead us there. Um, Now, you know me, I I, I write on church structures, church government, polity, that sort of thing. So help polity wonk me think a little bit more carefully, maybe answer questions you weren't, you know, addressing. Are you saying you have the main weekly gathering that Paul is establishing, we have the main weekly gathering, but we also really need four other kind of gatherings per week? with older men, older women, younger men, younger women. Are we establishing structures here like that? Maybe. (laughs) So. (laughs) Jonathan, I would think think you would want to at least look toward two. Right. Uh The older men discipling the younger men and the older women discipling in some form the younger women. Now, will it be very formal? Maybe sometimes, yes especially with women and homemakers, it would be ladies and their children hanging out, uh, watching one another, caring for one another's children, learning from one another. So that's gonna be a much more informal kind of arrangement where, again, I watched in my own uh, family growing up, as I mentioned last night, Charlotte learned enormously from some older women that gave us just, and it wasn't sitting down, let me tell you how I do child rearing. It wasn't like that. It was watching them rear their children. And then when we started having children and younger couples got married, I I didn't realize what was happening at the time I do now. They would just want to come and hang out and they would watch and they would ask questions. So I think that's also what's going on in what the BD exegeted and uh, what Paul's saying there. I think that's exactly right. Uh, We, in terms of our approach to this, we have uh, two meetings uh, a month. Uh, we have we meet with the older ladies of our church uh, for two hours, uh, and when I say we, I mean the entire eldership. Um, and we meet with this collection of about 12 to 15 uh, older women in the congregation, and we uh, hear how they're doing, pray together, very much the kinds of things you're talking about. And we read through three books um, at a time. We read a chapter a month in three different books. One is theological, uh, another is devotional, and a third is kind of ministry practice. For us right now, we're reading um, Wayne and Elliot Grudem's little book, Christian Beliefs. So that's a, a very sort of a primer, 20 beliefs. It's a primer on systematic theology, on sort of transfer theological content, sound doctrine. Uh, we're reading uh, Gloria Furman's uh, How to Treasure Christ When Your Hands Are Full, mm-hmm. some sort of more devotional work there. And we're reading Wordfield Women's Ministry, also edited by Gloria Furman and Kathleen Nielsen. Um, trying to give a picture of um, discipleship of women that really is centered on the word, driven by the word, uh, respecting all the other kind of structures and things that you were alluding to a moment ago. So as elders, those, that's four hours a month for us, you know, two hours or two hours with the women. We also have a similar group with men that we see as potential leaders in the church. Uh, so that's four hours a week. And particularly the meeting with the older women, that's, that's two of the sweetest hours of my month every month. 
Um, and I, would, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So following up on Jonathan's question, but more just practical. So when you, you shared earlier in a panel that you all just have recognized two new elders. So those two new elders in agreeing to serve as elders have agreed not only to be at the services of the church and at the elders meetings, but also at these two meetings every month. That's right. Yeah. So do you, when during the week do you put these meetings? Are they on a Sunday morning before church? They're or? on Sunday afternoons. Uh, so we'll have our regular Lord's Day service and then Sunday afternoon at 4, 4 to 6. And you'll do uh, the men and the women this, the same time of day, not obviously the same day. but That's right. So second Sundays right. is the okay. women, fourth Sundays is the men. So I'm here. I'm as a single pastor. Um, I've got a super crowded week. Your message to that guy isn't any one particular structure as such. He's walking out of here thinking, oh my gosh, my, my week is already crazy. Your message to him is, okay, let's just let's stop and first evaluate your priorities. That was your four categories. We already give lots of attention here. Is there a right balance? And just think through different ways outside of uh, the context of the regular gathering for you to be deliberate about and to pursue this particular agenda. Yeah, I, I just that say might, that, that might be what you do. It might be something different. Absolutely. Um, just say it a different way. I, I think the main gathering of the church is central to the sort of rhythm of the Christian life, yep. right? But I don't think you can do everything we're called to do in the main gathering of the church, right? Which means then we're, we're thinking through, um, and I like what Dan was saying a moment ago, we're thinking through, how do we walk this out together, right? It doesn't have to be this programmatic, canned, structured thing, but how do we sort of take the New Testament and see it in flesh in the lives of our people uh, in, a, in a regular way, in a nurturing way? Uh, and there will be some places where, for some period of time, uh, you might want to configure something, as we have, with the sort of monthly meetings. And there'll be many other places, ac ac actually far more places, where you probably want to be looking for ways of doing some of this without such structure. Um, so it's just how we live together in that way. And, and you know what, uh, let me just say, that's a great example of how we need processes to start things. I don't think that's the end all, but that's a great way to start and you're just building this culture because in a larger context, I think as you're, you're, you're alluding to, it gets very difficult to meet with all the women in Capitol Hill on one time. And even if you could meet with them, think how big that would be. But uh, when you create a, a, a DNA of discipleship in the church, what I think, uh, what I interpreted, which I thought the, the, the message was so helpful for me to just think through that, is when you have a culture of disciple making in your congregation, the younger women will feel like it's okay for them to go ask older. I had a guy come up to me after one of the sessions. He said, where do I start? Like, I want somebody to disciple me. I want somebody to invest in me. I said, well, start with your pastor. Start, start in your local church. He's like, well, I don't know if that's going to, and, 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 and I think what he's saying is it's, there's no culture there for that. You know, there's no culture in my context. So when you create that culture where it's okay and it's expected of people to be in these discipling relationships, then I think you'll start seeing, and I, I've done groups where there are different ages. So you have, I've done groups where I've had two guys in their 30s and two guys in their 60s, and that's a great dynamic there because the younger guys fueled the older guys. And then the older guys just shed so much wisdom on the, it was just a great dynamic. Well, pra I, praise the Lord, I, I would see the same thing. And I think in terms of sort of cultivating the culture, you know, we may be the folks who sort of initiate that process of developing the culture, but what you really need are the older women or the older men to say yes when they're asked. That's good. Right, so uh, my wife had the privilege of writing a chapter in that word-filled women's ministry book with Susan Hunt. It's an older lady, younger woman chapter. And she tells for her what is a very formative story in her own Christian life. We were young Christians, maybe been Christians about a year or two. Uh, she was sensing the need as a young mother uh, to have some instruction from an older, seasoned, godly woman. She identified two women, women in the church that we were in at that time who were exactly that older, seasoned, godly women. And she approached them uh, in turn, and um, they both said, well, you know, a little bit taken aback, let me pray about it. And they both came back and said no. And it just, it just gutted her. She was devastated. And she, she vowed that if ever she was asked to disciple a woman, she would never say no. She'd find a way to say yes. Um, now, those are godly women. And, and in the years since, and as they've had conversations, they're dear friends, um, they didn't understand that what Christy was asking was, let me, let me tag along with you. They said, you know, will you disciple me? That, that sounded all kind of official 
and big and, you know, a responsibility and I, I, don't, I don't have any degrees. And, and so they were intimidated by the idea, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, you know, my encouragement and Christy's encouragement has been, you know, find a way to say yes and, and don't make it bigger than it is. Well, and that's where you're saying the role of the pastor can be so helpful or, or at least one of the elders or certainly the whole body of elders, but just one of the recognized leaders of the church in an office from the New Testament taking that initiative can actually help set a model and then begin creating that culture without it happening through a young woman asking an older woman who doesn't understand and then feels confused. Yeah. Any of you have other things you do in your churches to help solicit uh, feedback from the, the, the ladies in the congregation? Yeah, you sometimes have the most awkward pauses. So you're like, <laughs> anything you guys do in your church to solicit? <laughs> All right, ladies, where are we? That's funny. That's funny. I, I actually. <laughs> uh, this I is how you and Jonathan are did very feel, old did you feel friends. That? Let me I just felt, stress you this. You felt that, right? That was the awkward. Word solicit came out, and my brain was like, whoa. <laughs> but thank you, thank you for calling attention to that. It's very good, fe it's very good feedback. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were saying, brother? Um. <laughs> Any of you guys have other ways in which you ask and involve women in your church to, to do this? There you go, thank you. <laughs> and that felt so warm and different. That, I know. Uh, I felt loved the way he asked that question. <laughs> How about you, Danny? Oh, yes. yeah. I'd like to hug you. Yeah. <laughs> so in our, uh, our preaching application team that sits down and we study the text together, we critique the sermon, uh, we've uh, put key at times uh, women leaders in the midst of that conversation. Um, and they're not the majority around the table, but it's been really wonderful. So our director of women's ministry was a part of that. And then she got connected with the um, folks at uh, TGC on studying the, the, the scriptures for themselves. So those two things combined just really sort of opened her eyes. Uh, things of that sort um, have been really helpful. Another thing I did at one point was I just wanted to get some feedback from people before I did preaching application team. And I had this little email uh, form that I asked some people in the church I just selected them if they wouldn't mind just giving me some feedback in terms of what they heard critique on Sunday and then I asked particular two women who I trusted who were godly to give me their feedback in terms of what they were hearing and um, and so that was really helpful just to hear how is the word being applied in a in a female context that I just wouldn't think about um, and is another voice besides my wife um, you know who's going to provide that kind of input and let me commend that because and I'm, I am uh, at the top of the list of being guilty. I think like a male. I don't think like a woman. And so I've watched over the years, my wife brought this to my attention, uh, that a lot of my illustrations, you know, sports, uh, boys, things that guys just naturally do, which is fine. But I'm leaving out a massive uh, component of our church and I think that's just something if we don't intentionally try to overcome, it won't happen. And having, as Mark just said, having some ladies that can give you feedback, maybe even make suggestions. Of, well, here's what I could have seen by way of application last week for me as an older woman or as I'm working with younger ladies who have children. Well, you could have really showed how that text speaks to this. I think the value of that is just massive. Amen. So I just one one more. Whenever a, a women's group, be it women's Bible studies, mops, anyone says, "Would you come in and just pray for us?" or "Will you come in and talk?" The answer is yes. Like I'll clear my schedule to because I have so um, non-ordinary opportunity to engage in those conversations that when they come or when they ask. My answer is absolutely, I'm there. And so like I speak every year to the mothers of preschools and, and the other you know, groups around the uh, church ministry. So those are really important uh, moments. And then when I had a group of ladies coming out of the last uh, Gospel Coalition thing say, hey, can we sit down and just hear how you put together a sermon? Absolutely. So we got a room full of six ladies who I just opened. Here's how I go about it, and here's what we do. And, and it was just really helpful. So really responsive when they show some level of interest in those things. And, 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 and the sisters didn't not only feel, but, but actually are being shepherded uh, in, in a meaningful way. Uh, and I like your point, Danny, about, you know, both of your points about sort of consulting and involving and hearing from the sisters, because I think it even shapes how we talk about things. Um, so I, I, would, I would dare say that 
um, it, it is no threat to leadership at all to consider the sisters, whether it's First Peter 3, 7, husbands live with your wives in, a, in an understanding way, in a considerate way, or whether it's shepherding the congregation. These are people that you have to consider, you should consider gladly. That's no threat to leadership at all. Uh, and, and it may even shape how we talk about these things. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a complementarian as, as, as deep as maybe anybody I know, um, but I don't find that the way men talk about that to be particularly helpful sometimes. We often talk about it in terms of power, and, and that's not the spirit of the thing at all. Um, and, and sisters who are godly sisters who themselves are complementarians, who are not sort of grasping for anything and so on, our best allies oftentimes are kind of feeling like, uh, why'd you say it that way? Do you have to say it that way? Can we, you know, here's how I think about it, and I think being humble enough to listen to that will actually make you more effective Absolutely. at teaching many things that you want to teach the entire congregation, including the sisters. Most of your talk was on outside of the pulpit. You guys would agree, especially with what, I'm kind of going off what you just said, Danny, in the pulpit as well, we need to apply our sermons and look for ways to be conscientious about different kinds and gender, generational types of people. Would you guys all, are you guys all, do you all work at that? Yeah, yeah it, 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 and one thing that I've had to do before, I had to do this with single adults, I had to do this with ethnicity issues, is I need a point person who has a standing permission that if I ever miss an application or if I could have developed that just a little bit, they have permission to come up to me after any of our services and say, hey, here's just a thought for you. And like, they're my go-to person. I want them to listen through that lens to help me think, yeah, I could have applied this just a little differently. So next time I come around, um, you can do it more, do it more yeah. effectively. Yeah. We only have 20 minutes left and I wanna start kind of getting into just last few areas we might not have touched on. But by way of transition, Thabiti, is there, you talked about generation and uh, gender. Is there anything else, brother, to put you on the spot that you'd want to say to uh, a room largely full of majority culture individuals, white individuals, on the topic of how to be sensitive in areas of race, especially with recent things? Uh, it was just mentioned to me beforehand, something happened again last night that I was unaware of. Any counsel, brother, that you could offer to us on being sensitive and careful on race lines right now as pastors in, let's say, largely white churches, just looking here. Uh, first, I love you. And I'm not saying that facetiously. I do. Um, and I think it's necessary for us in these seasons to be saying that to each other. As often we're too quick to the issue at hand and our, our particular perspective on the incident and what happened or didn't happen and who needs to be defended, who needs to be what have you, that, that we forget to say I love you. And, um, and, and oftentimes that's enough. Um, so I would say to my brethren, affirm your love for your brothers and sisters of different hue. Um, secondly, I would say it's, it goes a long way toward reconciliation to listen to people. It just goes a long way. You don't have to agree. And uh, as you're listening, you don't have to be formulating your argument and your retort and things of that sort. Listening is its own gift to people. And if you would uh, listen and just ask open-ended questions and uh, follow up with a question and, and reflect what you're hearing without judgment, uh, people will go away feeling like, oh, we can have a conversation. I can be that point person who, who gives feedback, and uh, you'll receive that. Um, the third thing I, I would say is I think it's incumbent upon us all, whatever our ethnic backgrounds, the Bible calls us to think as highly of others as we do ourselves. And um, I think it's incumbent upon us all to sort of behind that, that veil, if I can use that phrase, to sort of not only listen and affirm love, but, but love actually requires justice, right? I, I love this line from Dr. King, that, that justice is love correcting everything that revolts against love, right? And so a, a, a loving society is also a just society. And so in addition to the listening in ways that you think appropriate, in ways that don't violate your own conscience or don't violate your understanding of the Bible, really do be people who seek justice. I mean, that's just 
through the scripture. We're to be those kind of people. And so I think we live in a day and age that, that begs us to be active, you know, certainly in our local churches, in communicating love, in building relationships, in encouraging each other. Um, but I think increasingly in, in our broader, in the communities that we are in, we have to bear witness um, to what's good and right and true and what's lovely. And uh, so to be willing to die to self and to take a risk uh, and to be active. I think those are the things, those are the exhortations I would, I would give yeah, this morning. Helpful. And I even feel conscientious in asking the question insofar as I've had African-American friends say to me, why is it that you always ask the, you know, the black guy to come and talk about black stuff? Why, 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 why is that? talk about the atonement? Why, why is that? <laughs> because no. I recognize you have a perspective that I don't have, Amen. and I want to learn Amen. from it. And I, and I know, brother, in fairness to you, because I, I imagine that some people could look, be thinking that themselves, I know you have this kind of conversation with a lot of people, uh, and you have invested a lot of energy and even tears and a lot of other things in, into these conversations on in sort of multiple fronts, being a peacemaker, being a broker of truth, uh, trying to bring to bear the, the grace of the gospel in those conversations. So I, I, though I give you a hard time, even publicly, I, I want to say also publicly, I deeply respect uh, and admire and love you for those things. Thank you, Ron. Um, yeah, and, and this is a more, another answer to your question about why you asked the black guy. Um, well, that's one way to look at it, but, but here's the other thing that's important about listening. Um, all black folks don't think alike. Yeah, right. So you gotta ask, if you're gonna ask, ask more than one. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 ask, more, ask more than one, right? And, um, and you start, and, and, so the, and so the picture of people not like you begins to take on depth and definition. Oh, snap, they're a lot like my community. Yeah. They got the same aspirations and long as that I have. Oh, he thinks like me, he doesn't. And, uh, and, and, and what we'll find is that that's just sharpening. That's just deepening and sharpening. Yeah. Thank, thank you all for touching my arm so much. It was very <laughs> encouraging. We, we got to remember to separate you two. <laughs> please, please, bro. <laughs> um, can I push back on something you two? I'm transitioning. Push back on something you both said? Mark? You, you and Virgo. The man's name is Mark. You can't pronounce his last name. The man's name is Mark. I got it. I got it. Virgo. <laughs> Got it, but let's, stick with, let's stick with Mark. You, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> He's so kind. Um, I have had people come to me and ask me to disciple them, and I've said no. I just like, I don't have time. Too much going on. Would you tell me never to say no? Do you guys never say no when people ask you to disciple them? I can't think of a time where I've said no. Um, but if I have felt the pinch of, say, time, for example, um, then I try to be upfront and clear about two things. Uh, one, again, it's going to be their responsibility to take some ownership of their spiritual life by organizing, sort of following up to get the time. Yeah. Right? Uh, and then the second thing that I try to do is, again, back to what Danny was saying a moment ago, to say, okay, we're going to have to do this in the stream of stuff I'm already doing. Right, so if you want to join me for sermon prep yeah. and see how I put together sermons, you're, you're welcome to do that. Uh, and that's, that's enriching, I, I, I love that. Or I've got to make this run to the hospital. Um, you, you want to go with me to visit this, this saint? Um, and so we, we have to do it in the stream of things that I'm already doing. Good. For some good reasons and some not so good reasons, I'm not inclined to say no. Instead what I'll say is something like, let's, let's talk about that. And so we'll set up a coffee or we'll connect. And then what I want to find out is what are they looking for? Mm -hmm. And normally what I will then say is, tell you what, we got some other things that, 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 I'm, that I'm already doing and would love to have you come along with me in some of those things. And so trying to find a place to gauge, is this um, a legitimate discipleship request or is it something else? Because there's a lot of other people that could, do I need to disciple this guy versus another one of our elders who frankly would have a lot more to offer. And yeah. what I'm a little 
nervous about is for them to be terribly disappointed in the, the discipleship relationship. Um, and so the other thing is I tell them that, look, I, I was discipled by a lot of guys who never really knew they even discipled me. And so my discipleship pathway was discipleship as groupie. So I would just basically show up at these events or these yeah. things that guys were involved in or a seminary prof. I took all the classes that he taught. And if he's doing a Bible study afterwards, I was at that. Day. And if he said, hey, I got this coffee, I'm there. And so I just keep showing up. And after a while, we become friends. And then before we know it, I'm asking him questions. And he's ended up discipling me. And I've also seen young guys do that to me without me even realizing the playbook until like six weeks later. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And then, uh, this, is, this is kind of great, okay, let's, let's do this. And then finally, um, like in the preaching application team, invariably the guys who come through that, and we limit the amount of time. We do about eight to 12 weeks, and they would like to continue, which is really good. And so they ask, can we do this again? And um, in some respects, keeping them hungry is a good thing, uh, as opposed to suddenly now you got, in the, in my experience, you got this group that you're always with. And so some level of turnaround and turnout and spin out is, is somewhat helpful. So that would be my short answer. Do you guys disciple non-members of your church? Danny, I understand you're in a seminary environment, it's different, but for those of you who are pastors, will you spend a lot of time investing in non-members? I guess that's, the, that's probably the category where I'm tempted, I'm, I'm, I would say no. Um, I have done that in sort of specific limited ways. Um, but generally, I think this should be carried out in the context of your own local family. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, asking someone else to parent my kids. So, you no, know, it's you're in a family. Your parents should do that. Uh, there's accountability there. Um, I can encourage you in some sporadic ways, some, some one-off ways, uh, or maybe think through a specific thing with you that, you know, after you've consulted with your pastors and so on, they would say, yeah, you could do this, but kind of... Uh, generally speaking, to sort of do that for a long term, it's not been something I've done. Would, would you make an exception for that if it was a area pastor who? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, mean, I thought he was talking about like discipling a, other pastors in the area. Correct. Yeah. So I thought you were talking about like members of a, well, of a local that church. That was what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just and and that that to me just feels more is mutual. You know, is getting things from that, and uh, that's the fellowship. Uh, that we should be having as pastors in an area and so on. But I would want to know that that person has talked to their own pastors. Their own pastors have said, well, you, we think this is a good idea for this reason or whatever, and that we would be thinking through, as you were saying a moment ago, well, what, what exactly are we doing here and for how long? But generally, I would push them back to their church. Do you guys have you any know, ideas was, of like what percentage you would say of folks you would disciple inside your church versus spending time with other pastors in some kind of discipleship relationship? What's too much, not enough? Do you have I would, I'll answer this question and then I'll come back to that. I think one of the beautiful byproducts of a discipling culture in the local church is when you get to the place when you are teaching faithful men to teach others also, is that your people will not be so prone to ask you. You know, that's the great, that's when you know you're having effective disciple making ministry when you're not the holy man anymore and that your people are just as excited to spend time with Bob as they are with you. And so, and so what happened, so what happened at Brainerd is it, it didn't happen at first. It was kind of a J curve. We started with a handful. Gus and I were there, started with a handful. By the time I left, we had more people in discipling relationships than we had in life group. So we had more people in three to five than we had in these larger gatherings. And so they would come to me and they'd feel bad and they'd say, Pastor, is it okay if I disciple someone at the church, Silverdale Baptist down the street? You know, we like hesitantly, sheepishly. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that'd be a great thing. Why? Because we don't have a monopoly on making disciples, right? So yes, it'd be a great thing. And so I think, I think first priority though would be in the local church, would be in your local church. But eventually when this thing continues on and the Lord tarries, eventually you will have to go outside and because they're pastor, normally they went to the pastor and the pastor said, I don't have time. And he doesn't see his role as chief disciple maker and leading by example. The flip side of that, Robbie, how do you respond to the person who says uh, they're kind of on the periphery of the local church and if you sort of push into their lives in a conversation with them and they say, well, you know, I get most of my fellowship from my, my college buddy, you know, he's a good Christian, he lives in Idaho. But, you know, we get together every so often, and that's, that's really where I get my fellowship. I, I, get, I hear this, not often, but sometimes. How, how, do we, 
How do we respond to that? Anyone? We, we have a pathway. So the first pathway is, is to be a member of the church. So they, they, they join our worship service. The next step is to be a part of the local church. And then we encourage them to be in a life group. And I said this yesterday, but the discipleship, the D groups form out of the life group. So naturally, if somebody says, ah. So what's a life group just to find a life group? Life group would be a Sunday school, would be a, a small group, um, mixed gender group.